السلام عليكم نحييكم من جديد في نحن We will be discussing the international organizations and political economy as a serious challenge facing the Palestinian National Project. There have been questions at the international level right from the start. It's my pleasure to have with me in this session a group of distinguished Uh, researchers, Dr. Saeed Arikat and Dr. Tawfiq Haddad and Dr. Salma Karmi Ayyub. We will start with Dr. Saeed Arikat. Dr. Salma has just made it now. So we will start with Dr. Salma Karmi Ayyub. She is uh, a lawyer and a legal advisor who works in the United Kingdom and acted on behalf of Al Haqq from 2009 to 2012. And uh, She still acts as an advisor, international law to NGOs, and she's a member of Lawyers for Palestinian Rights and has published many articles in articles. You have 15 minutes, please. Good afternoon. Um, I'd like to say before I begin that I'm afraid I'm going to speak in English um, and I do apologize. I know that most people here um, speak Arabic, but I'm afraid uh, perhaps you can call me a victim of the fragmentation of the Palestinians, but I was born and raised in the UK with no formal education in Arabic, which is, which is why I will speak in English. Um, the second thing I'd like to say, which is a little unorthodox, is to apologize for my lateness. Um, and just to warn you that uh, I have been unfortunately a little bit unwell with a stomach flu. So if I pause during my talk or, or have to rush off, there will be a good reason for it, but let's hope that won't happen. <laughs> Thank you. So with those two disclaimers in mind, um, let me start. I've been asked to discuss the advantages and disadvantages of Palestine's recent recognition as a state by the UN General Assembly and its uh, membership of the International Criminal Court. These are measures which I'm sure many of you will be aware of, are part of a strategy of internationalization of the conflict that have been pursued by the Palestinian West Bank leadership uh, and are aimed at achieving recognition for Palestinian statehood. And they started with uh, Palestinian membership in UNESCO in 2011. So this is potentially a very broad topic and my time is limited. Um, as a result, what I would like to do is first um, outline what I see as some of the main advantages of uh, this strategy, in particular one of the main political advantages and also one of the main practical advantages. And I want to focus on the question of ICC membership, going through uh, the benefits but also uh, explaining that there are many challenges and obstacles associated with being a member of the ICC, so that it's not necessarily the panacea that some people think it is. So that will be the first section of my presentation. In the second section, I'd like to discuss what I think are the main shortcomings of the campaign um, for statehood and associated measures. And my overarching observation will be that these measures are potentially very beneficial, but not sufficient on their own. And if pursued at the expense of other strategies, could even be counterproductive. And thirdly and finally, I'll end by making a couple of very brief and broad recommendations for what I think we, we could do to make better use of this strategy in the future. So let me start with the general advantages of 
being accorded um, the status of a non-member observer state in the United Nations. Now, many of you will be aware that this happened when the UN uh, General Assem Assembly voted a resolution in favor of the status on the 29th of November 2012. And in so doing, upgraded, upgraded Palestine from its previous position of an observer entity to an observer state. And this vote came after a failed attempt by the Palestinian leadership to seek full membership at the UN. Now, there is some disagreement amongst international lawyers and governments of different states about the precise legal effect of this resolution, but most commentators would agree it amounted to an, at least an implicit recognition of Palestinian statehood within the 67 lines by those states voting in favor of it. And indeed, it has had the effect since it was passed of allowing Palestine essentially to act like a state in the sense of being able to sign international treaties and join international bodies. And on the political level has provoked several bilateral recognitions of statehood from governments who had not previously recognized Palestine. So for example, Sweden, I think, did this in 2014. So of course, this measure, the recognition of statehood, doesn't affect the reality of occupation on the ground. But its value, in my view, is that it constitutes an unequivocal um, affirmation, or perhaps a reaffirmation, you could say, by the international community of the Palestinian right to exercise self-determination in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem and Gaza, through the creation of, amongst other things, a state. Uh, and this helps, therefore, confirm uh, and add legitimacy to the position that the occupied Palestinian territory is, is indeed that. It is Palestinian territory, that the settlements are illegal, um, that the negotiations should be at least on the basis of, of the 67 borders and so on. And I, I, perhaps this doesn't feel like something much of an achievement, given where we're at, but it, I, I think we can't really underestimate the importance of these kind of measures, given the Israeli position, um, which has never changed, doesn't accept that the West Bank is in fact Palestinian territory. Um, it still argues it's a, it's a disputed territory, which it may be entitled to exercise its sovereignty over. Um, and as we know, of course, it has designs over the, the whole of the territory. So, you know, I think that that, be, albeit a symbolic measure, is, is important on, a, on the political level. Um, the main practical advantage, as I see it from the move, um, is it's opened the door, of course, to Palestine's ability to sign up to treaties, international treaties, and join international bodies in which it can better advocate for, for Palestine's rights uh, and try to promote collective action, um, and in which it can also, of course, access international justice mechanisms. And this is where I now want to talk about the question of ICC membership. Now, many of you will be aware that after much he hesitation and, and prevarication by the PA, um, they, the PA did finally sign up to the ICC um, by acceding to the Rome Statute in January of this year, and its full membership in the ICC came into effect in April of this year. I should also add, when the PA acceded to the, the Rome, acceded to the Rome Statute, it also lodged something called an ad hoc declaration giving the court permission to look at all crimes committed from the 13th of June 2014 onwards. Um, and as is her policy, as a result of receiving that ad hoc declaration, the ICC prosecutor has opened something called a preliminary examination in January of this year, and that's basically a stage before investigation where she looks to see whether the grounds for investigating crimes are met. Now, what's the main benefit of all of this? It's pretty obvious, I, I guess, but perhaps not to everybody who's, who's unaware of, of what the ICC is. What, what membership means is that it allows the court um, to have the jurisdiction to investigate and prosecute cases of genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes committed in Palestine, i.e. West Bank, including East Jerusalem and Gaza Strip, from any date from the date of 13th of June 2014 onwards. 
Um, those are obviously can be crimes that have been committed by the Israeli authorities, even though Israel isn't a member of the court and is obviously vehemently opposed to this course of action. And the only other way to have got that kind of investigation going would have been through the UN Security Council. And we know that the US would surely veto any such resolution. So it, this has really been, ICC membership is really the only practical route for Palestine to potentially initiate a war crimes case against Israel. Um, and again, I don't, I don't want to labor the point because I imagine we're all very familiar with the violations that occur on the ground, but this fact that there could be a case, um, in my view, fulfills a very urgent and strongly felt need amongst uh, Palestinians for some kind of accountability for Israel's rights violations in the context of the very pervasive and almost complete impunity that Israel enjoys for those violations. Um, briefly then, what are the types of crimes that come under the court's remit? Uh, could be crimes committed during hostilities. So of course the actions during the assaults on Gaza come to mind, like targeting of civilians, disproportionate attacks, but also crimes committed in a non-military setting. So that would include, include settlement uh, expansion, establishment and expansion, which is a war crime. Things like house demolitions, crimes committed during so-called law enforcement operations, like the kinds of shootings of civilians and protesters that we're seeing at the moment across the West Bank and Gaza. And from the legal point of view, what's of interest is that the court focuses on the most serious crimes and likes to also to focus on crimes that are committed pursuant to state policy. And what this means is that it provides an opportunity um, to the, the, I, the whole question of ICC jurisdiction provides an opportunity for us to examine the legality of Israeli policies, not just the sort of individual violations that take place, but the overarching policies behind them, and even to look at the legality of the overarching occupation regime, and to characterize that regime as a form of crime against humanity. For example, the crime of apartheid or the crime of persecution. So it takes us beyond that focus on individual violations, which has been the, which has been the emphasis, I think, of many of the human rights NGOs and, and the like up until now. I'll mention two other quick benefits that I think that I see from a, from a action at the ICC, even if we don't get a prosecution. I think there could be knock-on effects at the national level. So, for example. If the prosecutor made a determination that settlements are indeed a war crime, even if she couldn't prosecute them. Okay, apparently I only have five minutes left, so I'm gonna skip through some of the other stuff. Anyway, I'll, I'll mention some knock on effects on the national level. If the prosecutor made a legal determination that settlements are a war crime, I think this would oblige other states that are ICC members, like the EU countries, to take firm action against those that facilitate settlements within their own boundaries, their own nationals that are somehow involved with settlements. I think an, an ICC investigation would also affect public perceptions of the conflict. You know, it would clearly signal the illegality of Israeli policies and help create support then for, for Palestinians in world opinion. Okay, challenges to ICC membership. Now, there are a couple of legal obstacles which are a bit technical, so I won't mention them, but I'm very happy to come back to them in the, in the Q&A if people are, are interested. One thing I have to mention is the possibility of, of prosecutions of Palestinians. Um, many of you will know the courts allow to prosecute all crimes committed on Palestinian territory, including by Palestinian armed groups, um, like military actions, like rockets, for example, that target civilians. And I think that any ICC prosecutor isn't only going to pursue Israelis. She, he or she, it's a she at the moment, will definitely want to go after Palestinian crimes in order to appear even-handed. So this is potentially a dilemma for us. Um, you know, we would be obliged as ICC members to hand over our own nationals if they were wanted. And if we refused to do that, we might appear very hypocritical if we demanded that Israel hands over its nationals. So that's a question for us. There are also some very diff difficult political obstacles. Um, as we know, and I'm gonna have to basically summarize these very quickly, 
Israel and the West are very opposed to ICC case, and they have been in the period up to Palestinian membership, doing everything in their power to stop the PA from joining the court. They've threatened economic retaliation. They've taken, in fact, economic measures against the PA. And I think this political pressure has three potential consequences. Um, first, there's a risk that the court will be pressured not to proceed. Okay, and there's some precedent for believing that this may be the case. Um, unfortunately, we have a very apolitical, uh, conscientious prosecutor, but she's not immune to these sorts of pressures. Secondly, there's a risk, we have to admit, of the Palestinian Authority not following through if it's pressured. I think that, you know, there's already been um, a lot of stalling in its action to take membership of the ICC. And I, there's something I would like to highlight that I find very striking. Up until now, although the PA has been saying we want an ICC case, we're taking Israel to court, they haven't actually referred, formally referred a case to the prosecutor, which is a power that all member states have to get an investigation initiated. What they've done is they've just submitted this declaration and it, they leave, that, that leaves it up, the top to the prosecutor to take action. And if she wants to go ahead, she has to get approval from the court's judges. So they're using an indirect means of potentially getting an investigation, which I find slightly peculiar if they are really as serious about it as they say. And thirdly, we know the Security Council, the UN Security Council has a formal power to suspend uh, uh, ICC investigations if it's considered not in the interests of, of international peace and just international peace, or th rather a threat to international peace or security. So again, we can imagine the US and other uh, Israeli allies lobbying for that kind of resolution in the Security Council. So what I'm trying to say is you, you could end up with all of this great initial action at the ICC and all of these files being submitted and the like, and in the end, not actually have a case against Israel, just have a kind of symbolic case because something will have, have started but then will, will be thwarted somewhere along the line. Now I'm told, I was told about five minutes ago, I only have five minutes left. I think if, with your permission, if I could just spend the last two, three minutes going through what I think are the disadvantages of the strategy and my recommendations, that would be fair. I've traveled many thousands of miles to get here <laughs> and many of the other speakers I know have overrun. So I'll ask for your indulgence for just a few more minutes and I promised I won't go overboard. Right, so I talked about this possibility of just having a symbolic case at the ICC because of the political obstacles and not the legal obstacles that I couldn't mention. And I think that this concept is, is symptomatic of a more general limitation that this campaign to achieve statehood recognition um, and accompanying measure, measures has, which I want to now discuss. So general disadvantages, I think there are really two main limitations. The first is these actions are symbolic. As we know, they don't really change anything on the ground. And if, if it's our sole focus, which is achieving recognition for statehood and joining international bodies, you know, we can end up with a state in all but reality. And I think that this could be counterproductive in the sense that it could distract us from the real work, you could say, of national liberation or of trying to attain freedom, which, which does require some change in the situation on the ground. So I think UN recognition and all of these measures are good, but not necessarily sufficient for achieving our goals. Secondly, we have to, I think, remember, I, I know I feel like I'm preaching to the converted here. You, I'm, I don't want to tell you things you already know, but achieving sovereignty, a sovereign state in the West Bank and Gaza, isn't necessarily our only goal, you know, as a national movement. By focusing on only this, we risk the, the danger of marginalizing other aspects of the cause, particularly refugee rights and the status of Palestinian citizens in Israel. And many other commentators have talked about that and the fact that there's been a general marginalization of those rights in any event through the political process, which appears to be gaining traction by this, this focus on the statehood recognition. Finally, my two recommendations, therefore, for what I feel we should do to make better use of these mechanisms, and I'm wrapping up now. First of all, to pursue an integrated strategy that combines legal action with other forms of action like protest, some kind of resistance on the ground, BDS so that it's not just symbolic and other people have written extensively on that concept of an integrated strategy. 
Secondly, we must widen the focus away from just achieving recognition for statehood to the entirety of the cause. And there's nothing mutually exclusive about achieving stated recognition and also advocating for refugee rights and the rights of Palestinian citizens of Israel. Otherwise, you know, we, we may end up forgetting our very important Palestinian constituencies. So in conclusion, I'm not of the school of thought that says these measures are bad or harmful. I think they're very useful, but they need to be embedded within a wider strategy that integrates um, different forms of action in order to be truly effective. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Salma. Uh, she reminds me of an old poet by Ahmad Matar who says, uh, Palestine and uh, the singers still sing, but millions are crying and more orphans are born because of what they witness. They went out on uh, on protest but they chant we will return we will return for the thousand times but none of that has happened our next speaker is dr saeed Araiqat. he is a writer and a political analyst and is bureau chief of al quds newspaper and he contributes al arabi al jadid and he is an assistant uh, uh, lecturer in Washington, and he was once uh, a spokesperson for uh, the UN in Iraq. كَمَا نَقُولُ فِي الْإِنْجِلِيزِيَةِ لَيْسَ الْأَمْرُ بِيَدِي In any case, when I, I really hope that uh, Osama Abu Rashid was here because I agree with what he said. We have no one-state solution, no two-state solution, or anything. We had a national project which ended as an armed struggle when we left Beirut, and we had a political project which was ended in Oslo. Nonetheless, we can talk about the current situation now and what we can do at the UN and what can the UN do for us. And despite the fact that uh, the objectives of the current uh, agitation now in the Palestinian territories, although it has its own distinct features compared to previous intifadas, uh, experts think that the current intifada was born as a result of the current reality and the state of desperation felt by the Palestinians, especially the younger generations, because of the endless negotiations by the PLO with Israel to end occupation, especially that some people who are engaged in the current Intifada were born during the Oslo period, the people aged 14, 15, young men and women were born in the last 22 years of negotiations and during the period of oppression by the Israeli authorities and the establishment of the war, the settlements and the special road system, other blatant violations which the Israeli occupation couldn't have done without the cover, the political cover of Oslo and Cairo 1, Cairo 2 and others. Also the lack of feeling of security as a result of the escalation of Israeli aggression and the Israeli army and the armed settlers, militias in the cities and towns and villages who play a supporting role, exactly like the French uh, uh, militias in Algeria. When uh, the, the French had special militias who massacred Algerians, 
in the latter days of the French uh, occupation. The settlers, since the Israeli aggression against Gaza in 2014, have exercised the utmost brutal acts against the Palestinians supported and protected by the Israeli army. We remember the burning of Mohammed Abu Khair alive. They no longer find it uh, sufficient to burn down trees they, and attack people in their homes. They are resorting to killing them now. And all of this comes when the Israelis feel that the Palestinians are in an unprecedented state of weakness because the Arabs are too preoccupied in civil strife and sectarian violence and wars. So therefore, people are too busy with the scenes of uh, Syrian refugees drowning in foreign seas to forget about the Palestinians. So therefore, in the aftermath of the elections last March, a government was formed which is totally for settlement activity and also when they witnessed all the Palestinian factions like Fatah, Hamas, Jihad, the Popular Front, etc. are so weak and hopeless now and the total state of uh, helplessness by the PA which is being dwarfed into nothing more than a security agent on behalf of Israel when for nine months the Americans conducted negotiations from September 2013 till April 2014 under uh, John Kerry's uh, supervision, but in the end, uh, they could not even force Israel to free a handful of prisoners. When John Kerry said he has achieved that and he will manage to impose that on Israel, even that he couldn't achieve. And the settlers moved from a policy of intimidation into pushing Palestinians into forced expulsions. And what happened to the Dawabsha family on the 31st of July, without any feeling of deterrence or protest from the Palestinian Authority or the Israeli authorities, in my opinion, this is a, crime, a war crime. I hope one day they will pay for it. I don't know. I know nothing will happen at the ICC because at the ICC here, and, and its history only ruled in one case. In addition to that, the lack of vision and we lack vision and we lack the view in especially amongst the Palestinian youth because of their feeling that they are faced with the crises and the increase in Israeli pressure because of the siege on Gaza and separating it from the West Bank and the economic siege which led to a deterioration in the economic situation and the rise in unemployment, especially amongst the youth and also the Israelis through their uh, aggression against the Al-Aqsa Mosque with all what it represents for the Palestinians and started dividing it along the lines of uh, time and place and age groups, which is really am well, amounts to an attack on the last bastion of Palestinian national identity. And it seems that this youth, this new agitation, 
as not the result of their religious uh, affiliation, but uh, their, the intimidation exercised by the Israelis against them. And when Mahmoud Abbas, on the 30th of September, I was there, he started talking about a time bomb. In the end, it was nothing but uh, a little smoke screen, totally meaningless. And this led to even more desperation felt by the Palestinians. And all this talk about uh, a new wave or phase of uh, national struggle and the end of negotiations. And there's a new stage happening and made every Palestinian feel that he and she is duty bound to take part in that. This may have an element of truth in it or Maybe Abbas's speech before the General Assembly in the end led the Palestinian people to realize that uh, the negotiation team led by my uh, relative Saab Araqat, of course, which ended nowhere. The, f the fact that what's happening now, this new agitation or uprising, is a direct result and the reaction to Israeli aggression. And it's no wonder whatsoever that spontaneous acts of anger and explosion can happen in view of the incorrect balance of power. Some lessons from the past. The first Antifada of 87 had uh, a main distinctive feature of strikes which was uh, led by the resistance movements. But now, thanks to Oslo agreements, the Palestinian people cannot use that because in the Area A people, which is control controlled by the Palestinian Authority, has its all the entry points under Israeli control. Gaza is under siege by the PA and Egypt, as well as Israel, of course, after three destructive wars waged by Israel against it. A second uh, uh, uprising uh, until 2004 was, in fact, a war led by Yasser Arafat, who uh, found himself cornered in, in a situation when he had to deal with of course, in the end, he ended being sieged by the Israelis in Ramallah and lost his life consequently. And then came the Israeli policies and the results of protest acts in that period until the current agitation made the Palestinian youth feel that all their acts of protest here and there in the recent past uh, did not uh, lead to any uh, results. In fact, the agitation now by these young men and women who do not, by the way, belong to any political parties, maybe the vast majority of them do not even know who Yasser Arafat was for that matter, and he does not represent a catalyst to them. I think uh, I'm fast running out of time. The United Nations and the Palestinian cause. Uh, because I was asked specifically to talk about the UN's role and which UN organizations should the Palestinians focus on uh, and to enhance the Palestinian national project to put an end to the occupation and guarantee the right of return, I think we must shed light to the strong link between the Palestinian cause and the UN. Palestine really has occupied a huge amount of interest and funds and attention of the UN, and the UN's uh, relationship at the political level came into existence almost immediately after Britain placed Palestine under British mandate, and then the different resolutions which came after the end of the British mandate. Uh, the second session 
1947, on the 29th of November, took the famous or infamous uh, uh, resolution of partition of Palestine and, and 42 percent of uh, Palestine was allocated Palestinians, uh, the rest went to Israel and uh, of course uh, Jerusalem was put uh, under international uh, mandate or something. Israel in any event did not uh, respect that. I have all the details but uh, I don't have time. But please allow me just to mention some issues which I deem important when it comes to the question of recognition of the state. The Palestinian leadership, which seemed so convinced of uh, uh, internationalizing the Palestinian cause, they should have uh, set forth a complete strategy based on number one, do not uh, uh, confine all their efforts to the question of recognition, but include other issues uh, like uh, refugees, uh, Jerusalem, water resources, etc. Secondly, to uh, the, the question of uh, the ICC, I think it should have been referred to the General Assembly. Number three, they should invite the General Assembly and all state parties to Geneva for agreement to force Israel to implement the Geneva for agreement in Palestinian territories. Number four, raise the question of Israel's membership because Israel's membership was not an ordinary membership but was conditional on Israel's fulfillment of the partition and the return of refugees. Number five, they should have uh, raised also the the resolution of the partition as the basis for the two-state uh, solution and to determine the borders of the Palestinian set. Number six, uh, Israel's refusal to withdraw from areas occupied in uh, 67 should have been raised as an act by Israel which threatened and endangered international peace and security and we should use the 377 uh, um, which was passed in 1950 uh, which uh, allowed the, the UN allowed uh, the right to settle or uh, uh, any questions relating to threatening international peace and security and take the necessary measures including military intervention and uh, if the Security Council does not do what is necessary. I've finished, but please give me a minute or two. I do not give the impression that I trust the UN. The UN is a failed bureaucratic organization, but UNRWA uh, provided uh, food and education for Palestinians, so I respect this program. Apart from that, I do not have any respect for anything. I worked for the UN, and I know what happened of destruction in Iraq under a cover by the UN. I hoped I would have more time to talk about the protection. Mahmoud Abbas talked about international protection. This is all just empty words, and they are meaningless, shallow, uh, insignificant talk. There are three examples of protection. Um, uh, Bosnia Herzegovina, East Timor, and Hebron. We in Hebron have 180 Norwegian observers who do nothing. There is no result. Uh, uh, this is uh, very long and it takes a long time to cover, but uh, first I thank you for allowing me the opportunity and apologize for taking too much of the time.
This is very important paper. It has both implicit and explicit things, but it does not necessarily represent our symposium to avoid any uh, any cases raised against us or complaints. Our third speaker is Dr. Tawfiq Haddad. Uh, he got his PhD in 2013 from South in London. And uh, his research uh, focused on the liberal uh, political economy in the Arab world. Of course, the word liberal raises a lot of uh, debate. Uh, the recent product of Tawfiq focus on issues of development, uh, political economy. Dr. Tawfiq, you have 15 minutes. Assalamu alaikum. First of all, I would like to thank you for the invitation. And I want to apologize for my Arabic. Uh, this is the result of living in diaspora. But it's important for me to attempt to speak in Arabic, although it may sound a little bit broken. I hope that the organizers can uh, translate my paper and distribute it because what um, I'll be talking about is rather complex and requires some careful consideration, and my Arabic is not up to scratch, so please forgive me. And I'm basing this paper on my PhD thesis, and I intend to publish it in the book next year. Uh, um, yesterday and today, there is almost unanimity that the current Palestinian situation is uh, tragic and catastrophic, and nobody can say no to such a conclusion. Every two years, Israel destroys uh, Gaza, and the people of Gaza now are trying to escape in boats to Europe. In uh, with the West Bank and East Jerusalem, there is daily confiscation of lands, the division, the diaspora, the 1948. Nobody coordinates anything. Every man to his own, and every man is an island, as they say. This painful reality that we are faced with. Uh, in fact, the political and institutional uh, paralysis is the result of a detailed planned uh, paper or plan by Israel and America. We have to study it carefully and first must recognize it and uh, recognize that there is such a plan and we determine what are the, the points of weakness and the contradictions in this plan if we want to circumvent it and do something about it? This is uh, a, an article by Carnegie talking about uh, Oslo. Mr. Yazid Sayer wrote it uh, talking about uh, Oslo Accords, original sin or opportunity lost. Uh, unfortunately, there is still an ongoing debate about whether Oslo was an opportunity or wasn't an original sin, as the article suggests. Unfortunately, this is the case. 
the situation we find ourselves in is the result of a certain plan. And let's be frank, what was Oslo? Oslo was an act of exchange between the Israelis and the Palestinians on certain objectives. For the Israelis, the idea behind Oslo was as the alone plan after the 67 war, the Israelis uh, occupied Gaza and the West Bank where one million Palestinians lived. And this represented a danger to the Jewishness of the State of Israel and the democratic nature of the State of Israel. If they naturalize them, they, it will end the Jewishness of the State of Israel. And if they give them, it will destroy the democratic nature of Israel. And if they give them a state, this will threaten Israel completely in its existence. So one month after 76, Egal Alon, the Minister of Defense, said we must do the following. We must take from the West Bank what we need of uh, land, water resources, important cities like Jerusalem, Hebron, anything which symbolizes something important for Zionism. And what, what we'll do with the Palestinians, we must find a government or an entity which will run the affairs, the social affairs of the Palestinians securing at the same time Israel's security and this will give us opportunity to continue uh, the, the Zionist project. This was Alon's plan since 1967. I think the Palestinian leadership knew that this was a defeat and uh, as a result of the defeat in Lebanon in 1982 and the Gulf War. So we have no other solution. We are surrounded. So uh, the general situation was such that I know they cannot be blamed completely, but uh, mostly. And uh, at least if we can get an international recognition of the PLO and uh, the leadership of PLO to return to the occupied territories, maybe they can do something when they are there. Okay, this is a kind of an exchange which was not balanced because the interest was in favor of Israel. The balance of the favor of Israel and achieving its interests. So therefore, the entire peace process from that day onwards took the dimension of trying to engineer a social, economic, and political reality which is more in line with predetermined American and Israeli uh, policies, some sort of reverse engineering. Okay. <laughs> From the beginning of Oslo until now, the Israelis and the Americans are playing a game of chess and we're playing Nogda. I just want to show you something proving that. You see the squares here? This comes from an American document, a secret American document. This is from July 1993, two, three months before Oslo, an American study, a detailed study talking about how the Americans in the transitional period can choose the winners and the losers from the transitional period. This is important, but nobody talks about that when they talk about the history of uh, Oslo. What did they do? They, they couldn't control the winner 
the uh, where of the transitional period. Therefore, they wanted to control the pace of implementation of the accord and the extent of autonomy and the speed of the implementation. In other terms, if it has given full autonomy to the Palestinian Authority with rapid implementation, it would lead to the decentralized bottom-up factional balance, which is uh, the more democratic option. We all agree that the Israelis didn't give full autonomy. They have given a limited autonomy. In Gaza, they withdrew very rapidly. The, the West Bank, it was a slow withdrawal, and this reads, according to their estimations, at the beginning, when you see the slow here, the soft square, the Israeli and the Jordanians would be the stronger in this scenario, and this would lead to another intifada. Revolution. The second point, which is the rapid but limited, what would it lead to? A cooperation between Fatah and Jordan. I have a little bit more time. In the report, uh, they say that this would lead to a civil war. This was in 1993. Uh, July 1993, before the signature of the Oslo Accords, and it has been implemented. I have studied the situation. And history has proven that uh, we are a mixture of the two squares that are down there. Another example. It's not a war, actually. It is the attack that was launched against Gaza, they have chosen the moment because uh, of the kidnapping of the settlers. They have created this crisis before, and they knew about the siege and uh, that it would result to a liquidity problem because uh, the recently building of Gaza would cost eight nine billion dollars. Neither Hamas nor Fatah got the money. In addition to that, there was a political crisis and a political division between the different factions and parties that would have led to this uh, motto, divide and conquer. In times of crisis, like the liquidity crisis, all institutions will go back to the sources of funding, the ideology, the institutions, in order to overcome this problem, Fatah will go to their source of uh, funding, Hamas as well, and that's it. <coughs> It was an attempt to reverse history because it destroys the Palestinian unity. How could we overcome the situation? This is the most important part of the conference, the most important question to be asked. First and foremost, we should understand that knowledge is power. Knowledge is power. We should study the uh, situation, we should know the reality, we should know what uh, are the weaknesses, and we should focus on these uh, contradictions and the points of weaknesses. So knowledge are the most, uh, is the most important thing. Second, We should focus on these contradictions uh, that are from outside and from the inside. When it comes to the contradictions from the outside, there is a contradiction between the West and Israel. Of course, any uh, average Jew or the citizen in the uh, United States uh, is, does not consider that it is 
has bus centers to pay taxes for Israel. There's also this contradiction between Zionism and uh, Israel. And there is also a contradiction between occupation and uh, the legitimacy of uh, resistance. The resistance was very important to the West during World War II. So we should shed light on this contradiction when it comes to the internal level. Of course, we don't want to deepen these contradictions and divisions. They are, they are already way too deep. When it comes to this division, at least we should stop. I do not want uh, to uh, say that this is not important. It is part of the Palestinian experience, but we should pause and study the reality and identify whether we can work on something to unify and for the best interest of everyone. Because Oslo Accords in general uh, was an attempt uh, to, to interpret or translate this uh, main contradiction between the Zionist movement and the Palestinian people, they wanted to transform it into a, a class, a societal class uh, a clash. This is why we should be sensitive vis-a-vis -vis this uh, general idea. The economic plans of the Palestinians, there should be some sort of sensitivity to this. We shouldn't, we shouldn't create a specific uh, class that would benefit from Oslo Accords and uh, the rest of them have nothing to do with this and it would deepen the clash of classes. The last point. The most important thing uh, that we should focus on, of course, uh, the BDS, the resistance. Uh, the BDS is something strategic, it's on the long term. We should deal with it in a very serious way. We should create a fund to support the BDS, to support the studies, to provide legal support to our uh, youth in the West. We have 30 European countries, uh, every 100 companies, they have common or mutual interests with the Zionists, and we should try to identify the locations where we can elaborate. The last point again is that we should be sensitive to the, the general situation in Europe and in the West. There is a crisis of capitalism. When I was in uh, Spain, Tudo, in Canada, Bernie Sanders, there's something happening in the world, in the West particularly, and we should talk to them. We should, they should be our allies. We, we should establish formal relationships. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tofik. Uh, your paper was written uh, from the heart uh, to the heart. You've got two uh, feet, one uh, foot in the Middle East and the other in London. We have a little bit of time, only three minutes. We do not need interventions, just a question or two questions. Please, no interventions. Of course, uh, during after the lunch, uh, there will be an open discussion. Just let us have one or two questions. Sir. Khaled Faris, uh, I'm a Palestinian uh, living in Doha. I would like to thank the lecturers and Dr. Tofik. Uh, we have enjoyed his presentation a lot. I have a direct question. These Arab causes uh, and the Palestinian cause at the heart of these causes and the democratic causes because we do not want to upset Mr. Hassan. The uh, 
most important burden is the Arabs themselves and the Arab system itself. Arabs today are tools as regimes, they are tools. When it comes to the Palestinian cause, the PLO was uh, fought against. In Syria, the same thing happened. In Yemen, uh, we can talk until the end of time. So the burden is an Arab burden and not imperial burden. Thank you for your intervention. Another question? I would like to thank uh, the speakers, all of them. I have a question uh, addressed to Mr. Uh, Tawfiq, a question to Why do you think that Palestinian state, just uh, to clarify, I'm not challenging your opinion, what do you think that uh, a Palestinian state would uh, come to the dissolution of Israel completely in the West Bank and Gaza? The second thing is relying on one U.S. study. In the U.S. there are thousands of studies. Why did you choose this study and to what extent does it represent the American uh, thinking? I do not think that there is an Israeli-American plan. Israeli plans, yes. However, the United States policy and the Middle East microphone, microphone Microphone. But to be realistic, the interest of uh, the United States uh, and the Middle East is stability. And the United States uh, thinks that the international solution of the Palestinian cause is in the best interest of the U.S. national security. I do not agree with you that there is a conspiracy between Israel and America. There's a series of plans, Alona was one of them. We're talking about the post Alona. Dr. Said, I will start with you. You have suggested uh, we are short on time now. After lunch, it, there will be an open discussion for everybody. We are trying to stop now because we need to finish the session. Please, one minute, sir. It is not me who is saying that uh, uh, the Palestinian state would fund uh, put uh, this violence uh, movement to the land. Uh, Moshe Dayan uh, said it uh, himself. It would be the end of the Israeli state. Uh, Israel is not the end. It is a mechanism for the Zionist uh, movement. Uh, and, uh, uh, it represents the Jewish uh, of the world and not uh, the citizens. So, any country, any state with real sovereignty, it will lead eventually with the uh, demographic uh, changes to Palestine. And they will put an end uh, the Jewish majority, they will put an end uh, to the, the project. As to the second question, of course, so we are in the post Alon era. However, the main principles of Alon are still there. The uh, autonomous regime, uh, the, the not so complete uh, regime, autonomous uh, system. It is not a U.S. Israeli plan. It is initially, it was initially a U.S. project. The Israelis have their Zionist project, but there's of course an overlap, and we should use this contradiction between the two. Dr. Saeed, just one minute. Do you have any answer? Thank you so much. In just one minute, I would like to answer the question of our brother there. Who told you that the United States wants the stability in the region? I have always lived in the United States. The United States does not want the stability in the Arab world. They have... Uh, uh, they have... Uh, created the constructive destruction uh, the U.S. has destroyed Iraq. Uh, the U.S. is fighting against seven Islamic and Arab countries. The United States does not want the stability in their region. The United States is based on uh, conflicts and uh, on the exploitation of oil, on the weapons that they sell. The United States has sold the Arab countries since 1997 trillion dollars of weapons and 300 billion dollars of maintenance contracts.
Thank you so much. Uh, I would like to thank um, the speakers, Dr. Sarah, uh, Dr. Saeed Arakat, and Dr. Tofik uh, Haddad. After lunch, please join us for this uh, open discussion on the future of the Palestinian National Project. Thank you.